to wait. Um, I do want to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional lands of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish First Nations. This land was never ceded and was, in fact, stolen by, from, uh, by the colonial fiction uh, that we call Canada. I also want to dedicate this talk to the Watsuitan Nation who are being forcibly removed from their land by the RCMP who are acting as a private security firm currently for, uh, to make way for a coastal gas link pipeline. And um, given one of the uh, topics that I want to uh, discuss in this short talk is human exceptionalism, I also just want to acknowledge that these lands and waters were also once the home of countless wild non-human animals who lived here in far greater numbers than they do today, where they were free from uh, human pollutants, noise, guns, control, capture, confinement, molestation, and of course, climate change. Uh, their stories are mostly untold and mostly invisible, with the general exception of how they fit into narratives of human utility. Uh, so when I was considering uh, how I would address this theme of um, invisible uh, in, this, in, in today's talk, uh, so often uh, non-human uh, creatures, animals who I consider my kin uh, came to me. Uh, I've tried in various ways in my work to tell their stories. And uh, in a, this world of hyper, hyper anthropocentrism, theirs to me are quintessentially invisible stories. So I have friends who got wind that I would be here today and threatened to heckle me. Uh, so I'm really happy that everyone is muted. <laughs> but uh, I, I really just want to raise that because for one, it's true. But for two, I just want to show that I actually do have a sense of humor and uh, I do enjoy the lighter things in life. Uh, and, and I mean, what we need right now so desperately is laughter, is music, is art, is poetry, is good food, good wine, uh, good friends. Um, so, you know, if anyone wants to discuss those things later in the conversation, I'm, I'm more than happy to do so. But uh, it is my view that in this moment in time, what we also need is steadfast seriousness, courage, and um, resiliency as we go forward. These are not times for uh, the light of heart. After two to 500 years of colonization, depending on what part of the world you're in, 250 years since the Industrial Revolution and about 40 years of neoliberalism, we are standing on the edge of a proverbial cliff, facing countless as existential crises uh, with climate, the climate emergency overshadowing and intersecting with them all. I mean, in our part of the world, I'm really hoping that those that are joining us, at least from British Columbia, who experience the uh, heat dome the fires, the burning of Lytton, the smoky and flame painted skies for days on end. And now more recently, the atmospheric river, the floods, the lands, uh, mudslides. I hope that those of you who weren't convinced before, and I really want to acknowledge many were and many are so deeply already involved in resisting the climate catastrophe. Uh, those who weren't convinced before perhaps are convinced now that we are um, facing a perilous and vertiginous fate. So I identify myself as an artist dedicated to filmmaking as craft, philosophy, and activism. And uh, anyone that wants to talk cra the craft of filmmaking uh, in the conversation, I'm absolutely delighted to do. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. But in this short talk, I want to really address um, more of the philosophical issues related to some of the themes that I address in my work. Uh, I don't think Mark knew when he asked me to be this month's speaker just how uh, central invisibility and it is to my work. Um, I have really, in all of my work, uh, investigated, discovered, tried to discover, explored, and tried to expose and shine a light on um, that which is unseen. 
Uh, the one thread that runs through literally all of my work is this desire to make the familiar strange, uh, to de-reify, to expose the social construction of our perceived reality. In other words, to make things that are generally invisible to our culture visible. So I'm a storyteller who believes in the central role of stories to shape us. For me, stories are not just abstract, fanciful things, but they have the power to help manifest material, psychological, and spiritual realities. My work questions dominant narratives and tries to imagine new narratives to define and give our lives meaning. To imagine is to engage in, with the invisible. For the imaginary is not yet material, it is not yet manifest, but it could be. And that's how my work intersects with hope. So anyway, just to get us started, I want to show you uh, two trailers um, to my two recent films. Uh, the first one um, is the trailer to The New Corporation, which is the sequel to our film, The Corporation, which I co-directed with Mark Akbar and edited and Joel Bakken wrote, uh, it was released in 2003. So the sequel Mark will play shortly is uh, The New Corporation, The Unfortunately Necessary Sequel, co-directed with Joel Bakken, edited by Peter Rowick, produced by Betsy Carson and Trish Dolman. Uh, and yeah, why don't we roll that trailer? The greed economy is killing us. We are so steeped in this commodification that it's hard to distinguish between being a consumer and being a citizen. Seeing the documentary The Corporation, it opened my eyes. Calling corporations psychopaths absolutely had an impact. Can we take the resources of corporations and get them to focus on the needs of the poorest? There is no such thing as corporate social responsibility. They're literally playing casino with life on Earth. The changes that we fear are coming faster than anybody thought. It's completely out of control. Corporations have figured out there are really big business opportunities in these public sectors. Private schools for the poor is a $51 billion a year market. Take the education system, take the healthcare system. That's a direct threat to democracy. Their reach cannot be underestimated. They know everything about us. If we don't push back, we're going to live in a world in which they are governing us privately through the profit motive. One of the largest corporate bailouts with as few strings as possible in American history. Shameful. Global pandemic. What do we do now? Let's do a tax cut. The pandemic revealed that we need to contain corporate power. The democracy is trying to breathe. We can't breathe because of the weight of poverty in our midst. We have not come here to beg world leaders to care. Change is coming, whether you like it or not. Are you actually going to challenge the power of corporations? This is what the 2020s will be about. You have to really ask yourself, what was your role in this moment in history? Okay, so um, I, now I would like to show the trailer to my other film. <laughs> wasn't supposed to be this way, and believe me, I would never do it again. Also uh, completed and released in 2020, it's called The Magnitude of All Things. Um, I had the idea to make this film about eight years ago. It's a film about ecological grief. Uh, and eight years ago, when I told people I was making a film about ecological grief and the psychological and emotional dimensions of the climate crisis, uh, most people really didn't get what, where I was coming from, at least in this part of the world. Uh, today, ecological grief is sadly ubiquitous. Um, so uh, it tells the story of two parallel narratives. You'll get a sense of it in the trailer. Um, I, I just want to do a shout out to our DOP, Vince Arvidson, and producers Andrew Williamson, Henrik Meyer, and Shirley Bear Cruze from the NFB. It is co produced with the NFB. And I'm the writer, director, sound designer, editor, and co producer. So, Mark, why don't you roll the trailer? Thanks. And everyone can relate to grief of losing a loved one. But grief of losing your homeland, you don't realize how much you've lost until you stop and think about it. 
es como destruir nuestro corazón. It's like we're all implicated by admitting that the way we live is causing a catastrophe. If this land hurts, we hurt. destrucción de la madre tierra es nuestra destrucción. This culture is so unbelievably fucked. It's time for revolution. The thing with climate change, it's not like there's been one death and then we grieve it. This is continuous. We need to tell the truth. We can't hide things just because it's not hopeful. Will my grandchildren's eyes still be able to see what I see? Estamos en un punto muy, muy crítico. So, um, 200 species are going extinct every day uh, during the mass the six mass extinction event, which we're currently experiencing, that's 10,000 times the normal rate of extinction. So how can this be happening? Uh, because it's largely invisible to human eyes. Uh, similarly, the domesticated animals we eat, so-called farm animals, uh, are also, um, have also perished in very large numbers recently in the floods that we recently experienced in British Columbia. Uh, four people lost their lives. 640,000 non-human animals are known to have died. That includes 628,000 chickens, 12,000 pigs, 420 dairy cows, and 110 beehives were lost. The stories on the news were for the most part, not those of the chickens who perished or as the water rose all around them in their confinement and were unable to escape, but rather of the farmers who could no longer sell their bodies along with their untold biographies to the market. So because um, this talk is about invisible, I really couldn't help resist go way back in my filmmaking career to my, the release of my first feature documentary, which is called A Cow at My Table. Uh, which was really about the barriers that we erect between ourselves and who are in effect our prey. Uh, so one of the things that I did for that documentary was I traveled across uh, Canada with the co-producer um, Warren Arcan and my dog, um, trying to get into slaughterhouses, uh, writing them, phoning them, visiting them, seeing if I could film within them. Uh, I actually outreached to 60, 60 slaughterhouses. Of course, I wasn't able to get in, into any of them to film, and that was the point. I knew that they wanted to remain invisible. So, um, Mark, why don't you roll this next clip? It, this is the film I will also say uh, it took me about five years to make because I had to juggle earning a living and I made it on a shoestring budget and I had no idea what I was doing. But in this film, I pretty well taught myself everything um, I know today. So, well, no, not everything, but like as a director and uh, editor, sound designer, this is, this is where I taught myself all those skills. Uh, so please, Mark. Today's food production systems and the people that are involved have nothing to hide about what we're doing. Every effort is made to ensure, first of all, safety of the people and the animals, and for health reasons, the sanitary elements of what is necessary to produce safe food. Because of those two things, walking into a slaughter plant unannounced just can't be done.
to retain and instruct counsel without delay. You can call any lawyer if you wish, and Legal Aid Duty Counsel is available to provide legal advice to you without any charge, and they can explain the legal aid plan to you. Do you understand that? And turn off your camera, ma'am. Is it illegal to have the camera going? Well, you jumped into a compound and videotaped something. I'm seizing the camera. In May, she was thrown in jail overnight when she tried to film a dead cow outside the Intercontinental Packers meat plant. So, um, in this time of climate catastrophe, uh, my newest film, The Magnitude of All Things, asks the question, who is mournable? Is a cow mournable? Is a coyote mournable? Is a lake mournable? Is a mountain mournable? And I want to quote directly Ashley Consolo, who's the Dean of Arctic and Subarctic Studies at Memorial University and featured in the magnitude of all things. Grief, so this is Ashley. Grief, I think, is an inequity and social justice concept, but we don't look at it that way. We often consider it to be something that's painful, something we want to avoid, something we hope never happens to us. But if you really look at grief and mourning, it is profoundly about ethics, about politics, and about power. The capacity to mourn and the capacity to grieve and to be a mournable or grievable body means that people have identified you as mattering. We can see right now in humanity, there are so many human bodies that society doesn't consider to matter. So we mourn some losses and we don't mourn others. That tells us a lot about who we are. Why do we have this division of who we grieve and who we don't? When we move that to the non-human world, those conversations are just beginning. We don't even have the language to grieve the non-human world. We can grieve a pet, we know how to do that, but what if it's a forest or what if it's a water system or sea ice? How do we mourn beyond the human when we still haven't figured out how to mourn for all humans? So my um, film, The Magnitude of All Things, really posits the idea that we've largely failed as a society to address the climate crisis because there's uh, this, like, this emotional and psychological dimension to the crisis that for the most part, we're not attending to. So to be able to solve the crisis, most fundamental is that we have to tell the truth about the crisis. And that's a very difficult thing to do, to face our deepest fears and sorrows about the climate crisis. And I have a tremendous amount of compassion and empathy for people who turn away and I myself do it as well. Um, but we really just, this is like really the first step to, to addressing the crisis. And we really haven't told the truth. So Mark, can you um, please play the clip from magnitude. We hide birth and death and we also hide sewage. We hide all of our rubbish, we hide all of our waste. What are we doing when we deny the realities of our life and of our situation? This culture is so unbelievably fucked. You know, it's like you tell people stuff and it just doesn't go in. You, 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 haven't heard, you haven't heard what I've said, and this is the fundamental problem. I'm listening very carefully. Uh, no, I don't said. think you are. You're listening, but you're not emotionally connecting. Your message is so unrelentingly bleak and negative. It's not a message, right? When you go to the doctor and he tells you you have cancer, that's not a message. It's the science. It's the science. When we were discussing setting up, no one wanted to talk about extinction. No one wanted to talk about rebellion. 
No one wants to talk about what's actually happening, and no one wants to talk about what is a moral imperative for every citizen in the world. We live in a society that lacks honesty, and the honest truth is that we've allowed this sort of great big mistake to happen. It's like we're all implicated by admitting that the way we live is causing a catastrophe. It's all these things that we do that add up, and then the framework of the system. Okay, so I'm probably running over a little time-wise, so I'm going to skip the a little that last clip, Mark, just so you know. Um, and before I close, though, I, I just want to uh, make a case for um, invisibility, because I don't want to imply visibility and invisibility fit into a simple binary, and one is good and one is bad. So. Um, to all the so-called illegal aliens, uh, persecuted minorities, women and LGBTQ folk fleeing patriarchy, people fleeing war, the list could go on and on. May you remain invisible to those who seek to harm you. Uh, to the uncontacted tribes of the Amazon, I was told you were nearby when I visited, um, but saw no trace of you. May you remain invisible to eyes who see you only through the lens of profit. To the fossilized remains of dead plants and animals deep in the earth's belly, those that have yet to be labeled oil reserves and even those that have, may you stay in the ground unseen, undiscovered, undisturbed and undisturbing. To any plant or animal, human and non-human trying to evade colonization, standardization, sale, manipulation and domination, May you stay invisible to those who want to carve the world apart. May you be a powerful diversifying force and may you be seen only by those who will leave you be and by kin. So if we're gonna face the climate crisis then we have to tell the truth about it. And if we're gonna tell the truth about it then it's going to break our heart and we're going to have to breathe. But I do believe that the pivotal psychological reality of our time is to find a way to occupy that space between grief and hope. And these two spaces are not separate spaces in my view. What I've learned these last years is grieving is often a precursor to having hope and to action. We only grieve so deeply because we love so deeply. So letting grief in is letting love in and letting truth in. And that is a hopeful thing. And it can lead to being energized and being inspired. And those things lead to change. So thank you so much. And uh, let's have a conversation. Uh, so Jennifer, I'm just chatting with Mark here. We have time. Can we show this final clip? Oh, sure. OK. Yeah, so um, you want to set it up for us? As yeah. A, yeah. Well, sure. It's um, So it's from the new corporation. And it is. Um, I chose that particular clip just on the whole theme of human exceptionalism, which I'm addressing here today. Um, it's a often neglected and invisible thread of the pandemic public discourse. And that's really, you know, how did COVID come into existence in the first place? It, we, we know it's a zoonotic disease. That means it was transferred from a non-human animal to humans. Probably there's an intermediary host. And, you know, so many of the new diseases that we're seeing today are zoonotic diseases. And the the key thing to understand, of course, about them, as I know many people that are watching do already know, is that, that they come about because of our disrespect of the non-human world and our destruction of the natural world, which pushes uh, non-human and wild animals closer to hum human civilization and gives a, the opportunity for, for these diseases to jump species, a species that's not harmful in, it becomes harmful in us. So that's what this little clip from the new corporation is. giant ecocidal corporations. They literally play in casino with life on the earth. Their logic of profits, their process of profits, is the death of nature. 
Whenever you mess with nature, you don't know for sure what the exact impact will be. We chop down forests, we bring livestock into new regions, and we spread these new diseases. We're at the source of this problem. And major cities all around the world are vulnerable to a disease arriving in the city and then causing a major epidemic. And again, we're seeing that more and more. The rate at which new disease epidemics are originating, many of them moving from forests and wild species to humans, is partly because of corporate invasions into ecosystems and violence to animals. The attack on other species is bouncing back as an attack on us. Italy is now effectively a red zone. Warnings from Sao Paulo are dire. In the United States, disaster has been declared in all 50 states. When the coronavirus hit in the spring of 2020, it laid bare the unjust and dangerous fault lines of corporate capitalism. So it's question time. <laughs> if you have a question, uh, pop it in the chat and we can scan the chat or, or raise your hand. We did have a question earlier that we can start with, Jen, which came from Jess. And so Jess just wondered, does the corporation or the new corporation mention credit card companies? It's a very specific question to start with. Mm, I'm sure we have a few credit card lo company logos in there. Specifically, I don't think so, no. Specifically not, generally, yes. Yeah, thank you for making Invisible Visible this morning. Uh, my question is about children's uh, books, uh, picture books they are reading. I, I don't know what role do they play in terms of uh, their love for different uh, humans and non-humans. I uh, Because I find that a lot of children are fond of dinosaurs, for example, but uh, they forget the rest of the animal kingdom or plant kingdom. Do you think uh, we should focus on on dinosaurs or we should broaden it up? Because I'm broadening up to grandparents because grandparents are the most invisible human ray community now. So can you comment on picture books uh, role in the education of visibility and invisibility? Thank you. Sure. Um well, I mean, for me, picture books would fall into the store, you know, the, the category of story and of course narrative. And and as I said earlier, I, I do believe in the essential role of, of of story in shaping our reality and actually like very concretely manifesting and materializing in reality. But I think there's a place for both. It's very important that we uh, I mean, I think a lot of children do have a fixation right now, and it's understandable uh, on things like extinction, the end of the world. You know, that is something that you see so um, dominantly in, in much uh, culture. And so, you know, to provide children the opportunity to, to think about that, um, I think is a great thing. But, you know, without question, their experiences generally and especially in cities are mediated in a strange and bizarre way um, frequently through the anthropomorphization of animals and believe me when I say that I say it with a, a caveat because I do believe you know I I throw out and reject entirely the argument that when we ascribe emotions to non-human animals, we're anthropomorphizing them. That is not anthropomorphizing. That is just understanding they are kin, they are like us, and that we are interconnected. So what I'm talking about is, you know, the, the sort of Disney animals that speak and actually wear little tiaras or, or whatever, it, and are dressed in pink. That to me is anthropomorphizing, and that to me gives children a really warped sense of what uh, other animals are like. Uh, even our, our basic language is pretty problematic as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I even sound a little bit foreign, I'm sure to some of you now, because I was non-human animals. But anyway, I don't know if that, I, I'm no expert. This isn't my area of expertise, but I, I do have opinions around it just because I'm so um, interested in story. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Shiraz. Uh, a couple of requests about words. So the words that you shared, uh, Donna is wonder, wondering if the, the blessing to the invisible that you shared is, is written anywhere or if that's something that you could. 
Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I can share that. Um, and then can the, I share it afterwards? But yes, yeah, so go yes, ahead. Yes, for sure. And then yeah. the other question was, uh, what was the name again of the person who said that grieving was related to power? You, you read a quote from someone. Yes. So that's Dr. Ashley Consolo, and she is in our film, The Magnitude of our Th All Things. So you can find out more on our website. And, and uh, But she's out of Memorial University. Okay. Hi. Wow. Um, your work was really... <laughs> really impactful and um i'm remembering i mean like as a side note i'm processing a lot of my own personal grief childhood grief so it's like it's right here you know but um but what i'm remembering is as a child one of my earliest memories is seeing a logging truck and just like bawling like i just remember being like this i can't believe this is happening and then throughout my entire um, childhood, I just desensitized, you know, and like into my 20s and whatever. And, and as I'm, you know, doing my childhood stuff, I'm um, clearing a lot of that grief and, and you know, resensitizing as it were. So just my question is, well, first of all, thank you for this work. Like it, it's, it's reminding me of like a really primal thing that I forget and we forget. And so my question is, how do you do this work without being completely consumed by grief all the time? Like, is there, is there a salute? Is there optimism, <laughs> basically? Like, are we just totally fucked? Or, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's just my question. Oh. Like, how do you, how do you weigh those? Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Stella. That, I'm really, um, thank you for for um, being willing to share what you shared just now and I'm glad the work resonated for you and it's a great question and and you know I'm not going to pretend that I haven't um, paid some pretty big costs doing this work for 25 years I really have and um, I'm recognizing that now I'm, I think I feel I'm just in a constant state of recovery to tell you the truth um, but I think a lot about hope actually because as a documentary filmmaker there's a pressure to be hopeful and so I'll say, for example, with the new corporation, um, you know, people, no, you can't, you can't go down to this pit of despair. And uh, Joel Backen and I and, and Peter Rowick, our editor, we were all absolutely firm that the narrative arc of the film is just going to go dive, dive deep, deep, deep down into the pit of despair, because that's where we are at this moment in time. And then we're going to come out and rise from the ashes. So there's this huge and, and similarly, you know, with the magnitude of all things, it's about it's about cancer and climate change. It's, but um, it also explores hope because hope can be a form of denial. You know, if we have this optimistic, view, rosy view of, of what's going to happen in the future related to climate change, that's actually a, a little bit of a, for, not a little bit, that's a pretty big dose of denial because if you know the consensus science, it's a pretty bleak picture, right? But there's certain things within this picture that do provide authentic hope to me. And one is um, this idea of hope as a verb. It's a practice. It's an action, right? It's, it's just that you get up every morning and you do everything you can to resist because that's the only thing that's ethically available to you to do. But the two things that are also very important are the scalability of the crisis, right? So this is not a binary crisis. It's not you hit the switch like a uh, nuclear weapon and we blow up the world or we don't. What the last IPCC report made totally clear is that there's a what we're facing in temperature rise is highly vari variable from 1.5 to 4.5, even 6. And so what we do now makes this huge difference right? And even one-tenth of one percent actually translates into millions of people being saved or millions of people perishing and billions of non-human animals. Let's not even talk about life support systems of the planet, right? So what we do now makes this huge difference because we can still hit 1.5. I mean, currently we're on a trajectory to hit 2.4 if and it's a big if, and I don't think it's going to happen for a second. All of the promises um, that were made at COP26 uh, are kept. So, but it's variable, right? And that's, that's very important to realize. The other thing that's very important to realize is there's a lot of indeterminacy. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't have a time machine, right? And so we don't know. It's a mystery. And so I think those things that, you know, just keeping those things in mind, 
Oh, this is a great book, by the way. Um, and I'm reading and I'm giving it to all my friends and I'm in touch with the author, Daniel Shirell. It's called Warmth, um, Coming of Age at the End of the World. And I'm giving it to all my uh, friends that are in their late teens, early 20s. And it's, it, it really um, discusses hope in this very profound way um, that I really appreciate. So I think you might, you might like it too. But thank it, you. Is it possible to get that title? Can we can put it in the chat as well. Yeah, okay, awesome. <laughs> I'm, we might, I'm, I'm at, if anyone wants to fund this next film, <laughs> I'm in touch with the author and we're currently looking for money. <laughs> What's the author's last name? Right um, Daniel Shirell, S-H-E-R-R-E-L-L. -L. He's a, a young climate activist. Well, he's not that young, but he's a lot younger than I'll me. Definitely, we both have 14 year olds, don't we? So I'll definitely be ordering that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's pretty heady. Uh, it might be a little bit too, it's very intellectual, but it's um it's intellectual, but it's deeply, deeply emotional. So it's like, like that's, I, I love those lovely. things together. Great. So I have one question from the chat and then we'll go to Stella and that might be, Stella, you'll be our, our final, final question. Um, so the question in the chat comes from Vesminda who asks, how can I fight for speaking the truth to others by being invisible? And that is slightly, Vesminda, if you're, if you're there and able or willing to, to on audio or camera, give us a bit more of your thoughts around that question. So fighting for speaking the truth to others by being invisible. I can, um, yeah. I can kind of address that. Um, if we, I think we're all invisible, except for a very um, select few elite who have way more power and much more of a voice than we do in some ways. I think this society has rendered us in many ways to be invisible and that we're, you know, currently, especially with the eroding of democracy, you know, we're being surveyed and uh, manipulated to, to buy things we don't need, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I think that's everybody's struggle is like, how do you find a voice in a society that really wants to silence you, especially if you're speaking for justice and a livable future and you know, against things like white supremacy and patriarchy and human exceptionalism. So, you know, those things are not popular. And I think this is this is what we're all struggling with for those of us who care about those issues. And keeping it, as you said, keeping hope as a verb. That was a very powerful reminder. Stella, what is your question? Oh, Megan ans uh, asked my question. <laughs> So, Megan, it's good to see you here on the platform. But uh, so my question, I've just been thinking about it. And thank you very much for sharing such compelling eye-opening clips. Uh, it was very heart-wrenching, but expanding at the same time. But so I, I, do you feel a sense of responsibility as a creative visual storyteller to provide hope to your view to viewers? I do. I do. Absolutely. I do. Uh, but I also feel a responsibility not to lie to my viewers and not to provide false hope. So I think with the magnitude of all things, um, it's really interesting to me because it's a difficult film. There's no question, but people come out of it. Many people have come out of it telling me wow, that was very cathartic. That was very healing. I'm now inspired to go do this thing, right? And so that's very hopeful. But to me, getting to that place of hope is hard. It takes work. It takes courage, right? You, I just don't think that one, like Greta Thunberg, who we interview in Magnitude, says, you know, you, people want hope without doing anything. We have to earn hope, in my view. And so I think that sort of for me, the viewing experience for both the new corporation and magnitude is we don't just deliver hope at the beginning. You know, you kind of have to go through it and earn it. And I believe it's the same in our lives. So, you know, the last thing I want to do is immobilize viewers <laughs> so that they can hardly, you know, so they're crawling out of the theater when we had theaters. Um, <laughs> you know, that's not my, 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 my goal is the opposite. But my goal is at the same time to be truthful 
to be honest, to um, try and probe the experience of what it is to be human in a nuanced way. Mm -hmm. And how do you stay hopeful in this moment in time is, I think, our greatest challenge. But I, I am, I do have hope, just for the record, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> So inspiration, basically. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So in our, that we do have one more minute, and there is a question that's come up twice in the chat that is uh, would be lovely to end on. So Lillian and Hillary ask, um, in your work, where have you seen grief being expressed and collectively processed in the world? So oh. Lillian and Hillary are there. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Well, you if you watch my film, The Magnitude of All Things, you'll see um, there's a lot of grief being expressed there, including there's a youth grief group uh, that's, uh, that we filmed in London, which was a week at Extinction Rebellion, which, the headquarters in London, which was a week after they shut down successfully the whole city of London through nonviolent direct action. But uh, the magnitude of all things goes around the world. Uh, we go to Nunutsavut in Canada, so-called Canada's melting north. Great Barrier Reef, Tasmania, the catastrophic fires of New South Wales, the Amazon rainforest, um, and all these places, and, and Kiribati, um, the Republic um, of Kiribati in the a Pacific Northwest Island. So uh, everyone that I spoke with, that was, you know, what I went there to do was ask them how they were feeling. I didn't go and ask them about their solutions to the climate crisis or the technical or scientific details. It was like, okay, how are you feeling? And so in all those places, they, um, the people there who are extraordinary express a, a range of emotions and certainly one of the very dominant ones is grief. Does that answer your question? A little bit. Oh, a little bit. Did you, did you want to ask more something to follow up then? No, I think I just need to see the movie. <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and we do have some links uh, to find Jen's work in, in the chat. We've been sharing some links. We can maybe share those one more time. Um, thank you so much, Jen. How are you feeling right now? <laughs> oh, I feel good. I, I really am appreciative of everybody's questions and to Creative Mornings, Carrie and Mark and everybody, the team. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's an emotional raw time. And I think whenever I speak about this in depth, that's generally how I... I feel, but um, yeah, it's really nice. I think, I think very importantly, and I'm so happy you asked and that I thought of this as we as we part. Uh, what I do really think is important right now is that we do this together. That you don't grieve alone. That is just not okay right now. Like I, I really, people need other people to go through these very deep and difficult emotions together. And alone, I, I do feel it is just so despairing and so difficult. So um, I'm so appreciative that we were able to be together to sort of <laughs> to discuss this. And I just want to encourage anyone um, like Stella and others who, who felt some deep things while we were um, meeting, uh, you know, to, to seek out other people. And it's something that I want to do more of as well as, you know, grief groups and, and gatherings where we have the, uh, in, uh, even a longer opportunity to, to discuss um, just how we face our, our deepest fears and sorrows together yeah. uh, so that we can build a, a world that's livable and that's more just and more compassionate because that is also the opportunity. Uh, this is an extraordinary moment in time and an extraordinary opportunity to create change. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.